Yo, look at what Matt's done. The sheer value of the stuff that you shared. I've been doing this since I was 17. Very typical anti-school entrepreneur. And I just really didn't fit in. And I was very hopeless. I just was like, I don't know what I'm going to do in my life. I left school. I have nothing going. And I, I just felt very alone and started to get a very negative image of myself. I had very low self-esteem. We've got Matt Shields in the house. Yo. Oh, what up? dude. Matt, I realized our podcast hasn't dropped yet. I realized it hasn't. Our, it hasn't. hasn't. Wow. No, dude, I'm... I did. So I don't really do that many podcasts. And then I did like, I just, I wanted to start doing them because I was like, this is cool. This is fun. And so I did three in a week and then nobody posted them. And I'm like, yo, do my podcast, am I a bad guest? Do people not like my podcast? Yeah, man. I'm excited for it to drop though. That was a really good conversation. Like till this day, that was my favorite podcast that I've done for sure. You were a really good interviewer, bro. So thank you. There you go. You've just guaranteed yourself seven extra listeners by through that now. But dude, uh, thank you for being here, man. Like, I seriously appreciate your time. You guys, you guys will see why I appreciate Matt's time so much when we get into his story and like this kind of stuff he's able to share. But really, Matt, how did I, I came across you originally through that video you did with Thomas? And I actually spoke to, before I even spoke to you, I spoke to the guys. I spoke to these guys and I said, yo, look at what Matt's done. Look at what he's done with his agency and actually started like adopting some of those strategies. So that was when it, w- it was literally just through that, the sheer value of the stuff that you shared, where it was just like such, so overwhelmingly good. I was like, I need to figure out a way to, to connect with you. And then, yeah, we did the pod and then you've just been like so freaking sound since then. And just, yeah, great. So grateful for you being here as well, man. And yeah, really, really today, everyone here is an agency owner at all different scales. So wanted to use this as the opportunity to do, I, I'm feeling like a and a format will probably be like the way to give like the most value to everyone. So guys, if you like any questions that are coming through, just you can type them in the chat. And then if there are more specific ones, we can look at taking people off mute as well. But bef- while you guys are thinking of that, Matt, do you want to just give a little intro so everyone knows a little bit about your story? Sure. And thanks again for having me. Thank you guys all for being here. I'm excited for this because I really don't talk to that many agency owners. I'm not in a program. I don't have a program, but I love agencies. I've been doing this since I was 17. I, I dropped out of ninth grade and it's because I hated school, the very typical anti-school entrepreneur. And I just really didn't fit in. Like I felt very alone in school. I felt I was always getting in trouble and acting out because I just was in a box that I was like trying to get out of. And I didn't know how to until I just left. After that, I went through three years of very dark mental times. Like I just, I was alone. I became like the kid who left school. I'm in a very small town. So I didn't like going out in my town anymore because I had this very negative perception of myself and other people had that same perception of me. And I I just felt very alone and started to get a very negative image of myself. I had very low self-esteem and I was very hopeless. I just was like, I don't know what I'm going to do in my life. I left school. I have nothing going for me. I remember this one time. I've never shared this story, but I remember this one time, this girl I had a crush on. She came to the gym with me. She was like my friend. And she came to the gym with me one day and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what are you talking about? The first thing she said to me is, what are you doing? I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, you're not in school. You don't have a car. You don't have a job. You're not going to college. What are you doing? And I was just like, fuck, what am I doing? I was so scared of my future and of my life. And then eventually I watched this Billy Wilson YouTube video. If anybody knows Billy and, and uh, yeah, Billy came on and he was like, yo, here's how I dropped out of college and built a six figure marketing agency. And I was just like, this is a real thing. Like you can build a six figure marketing agency from a laptop. And I got the most important ingredient in success, which is belief. To get to six figures, you first have to believe you can. Seven figures, eight figures, nine figures. It's all just belief. And so I got this idea, this belief that I could actually succeed from watching literally one YouTube video. I bought the guy's course. I built an agency. Um, Six months later, I was doing 20K a month. I was 17 years old. Eventually broke that partnership with that guy, built another agency on my own, went from zero to 20K a month, this time in 30 days. So I got the process pretty good. COVID hit. I lost that agency, built a white label company called smafulfillment.com, built that up to 30K a month and just learned a ton about client fulfillment, client results, ads, all that good stuff and really got in the nitty gritty of it. And then one of the agencies we were white labeling for was just crushing it. 
He was just getting new clients every single week. Like he didn't really know what he was doing, but he was getting so many new clients and he was in the real estate niche. So I was like, man, this guy is killing all the other agency owners that are actually way better than him. There must be something about this niche that he's in. And that's when I learned the importance of the market that you serve. The market is one of the most important factors in your business, the market that you're serving. And so I asked this guy to partner up. He said, yeah, let's do it because he didn't really know what he was doing. And we partnered up and I called one of my good friends one day, Jared Curry. If anybody happens to know Jared, he had already scaled an agency to hundred K a month. And so I was like, dude, there's something here in this real estate opportunity. you got to come join me because I don't know how to sell, but I can get these people results. Let's partner up. Jared joins the agency and we go from 10 K a month to 150 K a month in 90 days. And we went from basically zero to 300K a month in our first year, doing something a little bit different called the hybrid model. And it's just been a journey ever since. We're now in the process of selling the agency. I was just telling Ibrahim, we got our first offer last week. So that's been a very cool process, actually selling a company, never something I thought I would do. And uh, yeah, that's been my journey up until this point. And yeah, if you guys want to ask any questions about that, feel free. But that's been, that's been the story so far. Dude, I love it, man. There's so much within that what, that I want to get into. And I also remembered that I actually got the guys to write questions in the doc before. So we've actually got a ton cool. of questions ready right now. But the what I guess like a great place to start is I guess like, would be like almost like the end where you're at now, right? So you're going looking at going through that transition phase into to selling the agency. And I think yeah. for a lot of people, and this is a process that I've actually looked at myself, got through to almost the end of signing contracts, ended up not wanting to do it, wanted to just do it in a bigger way. You're yeah. like, or you guys are at, what got, what are, what's your revenue that you guys are at again? It's like around 300K a month about. Dude, so I would, yeah, so starting there, what does that process look like of actually, how do you even go about attracting buyers? Yeah, how's that process going at the moment now with selling? Yeah, we've been very blessed to have a very good experience. So I can share what we've done that served us well, just so you guys can have this when hopefully the time comes for you, if that's something you want to do is sell. And either way, I do think you should build your business to sell it. So I can talk about that. Even if you don't want to sell, you should build it as if you were going to. And we can talk about that. But we hired a company called Barney. It's I think it's like barneyagency.com or something. If you look up like Barney Agency Exit on Google, you'll find them. This company, Barney, has been amazing, and they basically do everything for us. They list it, they reach out to their buyers, they sign the NDAs, they scan the buyers on the calls, and then we just take buyer meetings. And uh, we've had very excellent buyer meetings. It's been a very interesting process hopping on with these people who are like, we incubate companies that do $4 million to $40 million a year. Tell us why we should incubate your company. And you're just like, shoot, this is a different player in the game. So I would say the number one piece of advice with selling is hiring a broker that actually knows what they're doing. They're going to take 10 to 15% of your exit, but you can negotiate that and it's worth it. Because I've heard of people who've gotten screwed in exits because they tried to do it themselves and they've lost out on so much money. And it just becomes a legal hassle and it's not a battle you want to fight. Give up the 10% and start prepping your business with the understanding that if you try to sell it, you're going to lose 10% minimum to a business broker when you exit. That's the best thing we did. There are other ways to do it yourself. I just didn't want to go through that process. The risk reward just wasn't there. So this company, Barney, hiring them, that helped us a ton. We've probably had three good buyer meetings so far. We've had 10 interested buyers. We're going to get our first letter of intent on Friday, hopefully, and then we'll maybe go into a diligence process. They're buying agencies at around three to four times your annual profit right now, depending on how long you've been in business. So if you're doing 100K a year profit, you could probably sell the agency for 300, maybe three, 350. Depends on the assets you have and things like that. So that's been the journey so far with selling. It's been a very cool process and learning a lot about the game, just talking to these buyers, talking to these people and listening to the questions they're asking. Because now I realize like the things that I thought mattered actually don't matter to the people who are going to buy the business. So in a lot of ways, we built the business the wrong way, but it's a learning process. So what are those things that you found out that don't matter and what does matter from a... Dude, I th like <sighs> yeah, like I thought SOPs and all that shit matter. Like I thought SOPs and what CRM you're using and like all these KPIs, but really there is only two things that 
a buyer cares about. And I was listening to Hermosi talk about this because he is very smart, but he's very specifically intelligent when it comes to acquisitions because that's his whole company. They want to know the size of the market and the potential for that company to take over that market. So how big is the market and what is the likelihood that company can actually take over the market? What is the realistic ability of the company to capture the market? And then there's one other thing. I actually wrote this down. I want to make sure I get it right. How big is the market? And then how sticky is the revenue? So how sticky is the revenue? What is the retention of your revenue? And retention, sustainability of revenue is like the biggest thing they're looking for. These buyers just want something that's going to be around for years and years to come. They don't want a risky, tricky business. They want something that's sustainable and has potential to be big based off the market and then your retention. So get into a big market and then just build something that has very sticky revenue. And if you can show those two things, then you have an exable business 100%. Richard Barton, and I might have mentioned this to you on our first talk, man. Richard Barton, the founder of Expedia and Zillow, one of our biggest competitors, obviously, because we're in the real estate space. He said there's only two things he looks for when he's buying a company the size of the market, and the quality of the team. So that's another thing I would leave you guys with. If you want to sell your company, you need to build an amazing team because human capital is very valuable right now. A lot of these acquisition companies, one of the most, the most valuable asset a company has is its people because you are limited by the total intellectual capacity of your team. So if you have very smart people, then your company has a ton of potential. But if you're in a good market, you have a good product, all this stuff, but your team does not have the intellectual capacity to get it to eight figures, nine figures, multi seven figures, whatever it is, then you're limited by that. And buyers won't want to buy the company because the human capital is probably the most important asset. So that's another thing. Size of the market, quality of the team. If you get those two things right, you can build something great or you could sell something great. Choice really becomes yours, which is the beautiful thing. Love that, man. I love that. And one of the things you you touched on there that a buyer looks at is what is the retention right, of clients? And this is something I experienced yeah. as when looking at with a potential buyer. One of the questions I've, I've got on here that someone asked is during the early stages of your agency, what were the things that you did to get good results for clients? And to how has that evolved over this time in order to retain them? So I think the biggest thing you guys can start doing immediately to improve retention, it, you don't have to improve your product at all. You just have to improve the psychological perception of your product. And the best way you can do that is a really good expectation setting call. I will send you guys the exact deck we use because I've already given this away at this point. We made a new one though. I'll send this in the chat. This is literally a 90 minute call that we walk every single client through. If you go to that presentation, it's like 160 slides or something. And we're just telling them exactly what to expect, exactly what the process looks like, what a successful client does and what a non-successful client does. That way they know the difference and they can choose which category they want to fall into. And we get their verbal commitment. Are you going to do the things that it takes to win? Or do you just want to go ahead and commit to losing now? And we get that emotional buy-in, that psychological buy-in. We show them a ton of case studies, a ton of social proof. So we're reaffirming their conviction constantly because people leave when they don't believe. They leave when they don't believe. But if they aren't succeeding, but they believe they can, they're going to stay. So we're building their conviction. We're building their psychological buy-in to the product on this call. And we're just setting some very clear expectations because problems arise when expectations defer with your own business, with your clients, with your team members. When people expect something different than they get, that is when problems arise. So we go very deep into expectations. That's the biggest thing we've done that has allowed us to get good retention. On top of that, we're just always innovating. Like we're testing new things, we're testing new ads, we're testing new follow-up sequences. And then we're really building the just best real estate community we can. And we're teaching tons of cool shit. Like last week we brought on this guy, Mark J. Kohler. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Mark, but he wrote the tax and legal playbook. He's like the goat of taxes and like CPA shit. And uh, we brought him onto a call and the guy just dropped gems. Like we just emailed him. We were like, yo, can you hop on a call in our group? And he was like, sure. And he probably charges like 10,000 for one hour, but he just came on because we have a group of people. And on that call, a client literally unmuted themselves and they were like, dude, 
this just paid for the entire cost of the program. This was an insane call. So things like that, getting better guests, getting better speakers, getting better content and training. That's the biggest thing we do now because we're really trying to teach real estate agents how to become better real estate agents. We're not just providing leads. As you guys know, if you watch the video with Thomas, we've pivoted so far away from just standard lead gen. It's like a micro component of our company now. Amazing, man. And thanks for dropping that, dude. That's something we're, we were literally just talking about that today, about li literally about expectation setting as well and just reaffirming yeah. that. I think that's the thing. I think with retention, and this is something that affects, I've noted every, probably every single person here has either said this to me or felt this, which is your, you can get to a stage where like your kind of self-belief and value is equally correlated to the results you're getting a client. And yes. the problem with that is, when Facebook has a bad week, that means you have a bad week, even though there's yeah. zero that you can do to change that right in that moment. So looking at, look, this is why I love like all the kind of the different pillars that you have in the agency, because they counterbalance certain things that aren't out of your control. And they also put some onus on the client as well to be more bought in. And I think that's something yes. that you guys do so well, man. Biggest, biggest kind of, tip for the expectation call is transfer ownership of the outcome to them. If by the end of the call, they can feel like it is up to them to succeed or not, leaving your program becomes leaving themselves. And like, it's really hard psychologically to do that because they're admitting defeat within themselves, not just within your product or company. So transfer ownership of the outcome to them. Another just quick kind of nugget for the expectation call Tell them exactly what is going to go wrong so they know ahead. We'll tell them, look, you might go two weeks without getting a lead. Most agencies are like terrified to do that, but we just tell them. And the fact that we told them when it comes where they don't get a lead in two weeks, they're just like, oh, they told me this is normal. But when you don't tell them and they go two weeks without getting a lead, then they're like, what the fuck's going on? It's the same exact thing. It's just the fact that they expected it beforehand that completely changes their response. You can do that with communication. You can do that with lead flow. You can do that with lead conversion. Look, we might not get back to you over the weekend immediately. Just tell them that. Or look, you might not convert your first 10 leads. Just tell them that. Just tell them whatever the problem that they inevitably will face. Just tell them ahead of time and be very honest with them about it. And they'll appreciate it because you're being honest, you're being transparent. So that's just another thing. Be very direct, tell them the thing they're going to run into. While also it's like a dance, right? The best way I've heard it put, it's like a dance. Like it, it's not just aggressive. It's also, but if you can make it through that two week period and you learn how to convert your leads after you get your first 10, or if you continue communicating with us, even though we don't respond immediately, whatever it is, if you keep doing that, here's what your upside looks like. Look at what Michael did in our program. He made 20K in his second month. Show them the upside, but be very honest with the downside that it takes to get there too. And if you can balance that dance, then you'll have a very successful call. Your client retention will immediately change just by that one call alone. It's the biggest thing you can do, expectation call. One of the things you touched on there was converting leads, right? I know this is yeah. something we talk a lot about as well. What are some of the things that you do to help your clients get better at converting the leads that you generate for them? That's a very important question. We don't do ISAs or anything. All of our clients call the leads themselves. What we've recently started doing is we've tried to make lead calling fun. So we actually have gamified it. And we have something every week that we call the lead calling game show. So our head coach literally will have Canva design behind him. Like it's a game show, like he's a game show host. He has like a top hat and stuff and he hops on and he's welcome back to the lead calling game show. And like, he'll pick people out to call leads. And if they book an appointment on the call, they get like 50 buck gift card to their favorite restaurant. And then there's a leaderboard and like all that stuff. That's nobody's ever done that. And like that. It was completely his idea. The dude's freaking awesome, our head coach, because he's also a real estate agent. So like he knows the game that these realtors are playing. That has helped a lot because now people are like fired up to call their leads. They'll literally message him after and they'll be like, I've never been excited to call strangers, but now like I'm, I want to do it. That's helped a lot. Giving them scripts, giving them frameworks, going over lead calling and lead follow-up relentlessly. Our top coach 
is a guy named Barry Jenkins sells a thousand homes a year, which is a shit ton <laughs> in real estate. That's the only way I could put it a shit ton. It's a lot of homes and uh, he's like a lead conversion expert. So every week he does a call on like, how do you convert leads? He wrote a book called two nights for sales. It's like an Amazon bestseller. So he goes over a lot of what's in that book and he just goes over follow-up and sales psychology. We do it every single week. It's probably the biggest thing we teach besides mindset is lead conversion. So making it a consistent practice and teaching, gamifying it to make it fun, doing challenges that reward them if they have success with the lead follow-up. So we do something called the agent lottery. And I could share my screen if you want me to show this, dude. This could actually be cool to see. Oh, yeah, dude. Go for it, man. Real quick, is this, because I know I'm like, I talk fast. So is this, like, is this making sense? Is this resonating at all? Just put a, I guess, a one or something in the chat if it's good. So I know, and then I'll, I'll keep it. the chat. Cool. Sweet. Okay. Let's see. I can just show you guys a couple. This is like one of our coaches. This guy's awesome. But let's see. So you'll see posts that have the hashtag agent lottery XL. Agent lottery is essentially a giveaway that our clients get to enter every time they make a post in our Facebook group. So every time a client posts in the Facebook group, they enter a chance to win the agent lottery. And what the agent lottery is, it's a free ticket to our first in-person event. It's a free month at the company. So they don't have to pay for a thing. They get a free month. It is a free chance to get buyer ads. So we run seller ads for real realtors, but we also will build another buyer campaign for them for free. If they win the agent lottery, they get all this stuff for free. Like it's a crazy amount of value. They got a one-on-one -on -one call with me and our CEO last time. Tons of stuff, like very just good giveaways. You could add in literally an iPad, like whatever you want to give away and we do it quarterly. So this is a three month competition. And every time they make a post, they put this hashtag and it's a ticket into the agent lottery. And so you'll see since we started doing agent lottery, literally two months ago, we have 195 posts. This is how you build a community. Becky's yeah. literally putting a picture, a selfie of her face going over her CMA drop-offs, which is like her delivering the value of the people who are inquiring to find out what their house is worth, which is how we run our ads. We do like a free home valuation. She takes that and she delivers it to them. She makes a post. Sometimes she records videos. We have a live video of Becky approaching a lead, knocking on the door saying, Hey, I got your request on Facebook. And it's, she's so good at it. We played that video on a call of 40 agents and people were like, yo, that's how Beck I'm doing it completely wrong. So that's how we've built the group. We incentivize them to make posts by giving them a chance to win something. This also makes the group incredibly positive because all people, like you can't post something negative and enter the agent lottery. <laughs> so people are just going to default to posting positive stuff, which just helps in general with people getting better results. Because if shit gets negative, people start getting down on themselves. They start, they stop believing. And as we mentioned, belief is the most important ingredient in success and it just kills the whole vibe. So do a challenge for your clients. You can see Mary did a video. I don't think this person answered, but Cecilia, she's closed 20 deals with us. She's fucking insane. Like a steady eye listing appointment today. That was 21 hours ago. Been texting with them since November. Saw the house late December, listing it today. We go to the comments of this post. We're like, is that number four this year? She's three new listings this year from a steady eye and three closed listings this year from a steady eye. She's closed six deals already this year. She just put that in the group. Anybody who's not getting deals from us just saw Cecilia post that she's gotten six deals in this year alone. And she's, and they're like, damn, it's not me. Or they're like, damn, it's not a steady eye. It's me. Like I'm the problem. So that's the power of the group, especially when you do this incentive where you get them to post to, to enter a lottery or whatever you want to call it. And then we just spin a wheel. We pick a random winner. We do that on a live call. And then that person gets all the goods. So yeah, that's how that part works. Dude, that's, yeah, that's genius. And I could like, do your guys like on the sales process, are your guys like walking prospects through like this kind of stuff? Are they showing them like all of this behind the scenes stuff of what's going on in Estate AI? Well, how, does that, how does that work? Not really, dude. Our Honestly, our clients come in sometimes and they're like, why didn't you guys tell me what this actually was? Because this is like way cooler than what I bought. But we've gotten much better at selling it on the front end. The problem is a lot of people come in and they just think they want leads and they think that's actually their problem. 
most business owners, ourselves included, don't know the actual problem they're trying to solve, but they're very bought into the idea that they are right. Like it's easier. I think Mark Twain said this. He's it's easier to lie to someone than it is to tell them they've been lied to because they don't want to believe they've been lied to. So like our closers put another way, we sell them what they want, but then we give them what they need. Hermosi talks about this, like the dog who gets fleas, he won't eat the pill because he doesn't want to eat a pill. So you wrap the pill in bacon and then you give him the pill. We do that for our clients. We wrap the pill in bacon and then they come in and they realize the pill actually tastes pretty good, which is our group, our community, our coaching. We started selling it more on the front end, but honestly, a lot of it's like really focusing on leads. And then it's, oh, and by the way, you get coaching and a community, blah, blah, blah. And then they come in and they're like, the coaching community is everything. The leads are actually super small. So it, it's a bit of a twist, but most realtors don't want to accept that they need coaching. And so we just, we wouldn't be able to sell people if that's what we focused on. Got you. Yeah. So what is the, how is the frame, so, like, how is it framed to them on the front end of what they're actually buying into? That is a good question that that's not my department. So I won't have the best answer, but we, we break it down into four pillars and our pitch is like, we worked with Cole Gordon for a while. So they really helped us dial in our pitch. It's essentially four pillars. It's like mindset. Then it's how do you set appointments via our leads in your own self gen? Then it's sales mastery. That's pillar three. And then number four is scaling and firing yourself. So we pitch those four pillars and that's really what we focus on. But the way we do it is we make it seem like it's customized to them because every realtor really is having the same problem. Like either their mindset's fucked, they can't generate appointments. They don't know how to close appointments or they just are the only thing going in their business and they haven't learned how to fire themselves. So they almost always fall into one of those four categories, but the way we pitch it to them is this is customized to you. These are the four pillars we think would help you the most right now, which makes it psychologically seem more valuable because it's not just a templated pitch. It's not, oh, we're giving you Facebook ads because that's all we do. It's, oh, we're giving you Facebook ads because you said you had X, Y, and Z problem. So now it's, it's more valuable because it's based off of what they said, not based off of what you sell which just makes it me more meaningful to them, which increases the value of it. Got it. Yeah, it makes sense, man. And like, I appreciate you're not taking sales calls. So if you don't have an answer to this, all good. I've never taken a sales call. My, my partner and I have literally never closed a client for a state AI. Damn. Never sold a single client. I managed one, never built an ad. We've never done like any of the actual things. That, that is, that's a real SMA flex right there. <laughs> but I say that because that's the way you should build it. That is the way you should build it. Because it's so, basically you're not going to be doing sales calls. So, so you might as well you, do it from the go, from the get-go. So when you started out and joined together, were you at zero or did you join and there was like already revenue there? I start I partnered. That's a good question. I partnered with it when it was like 5K, 10K. And then I brought my partner in at like 15, 18 ish. And then we just skyrocketed from there. So when I say zero to 300K a month, it's technically 10K to 300K a month, which is a big difference. But 10K to 300K a month just doesn't look good in YouTube titles. So I just, I put zero. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, you can, y'all can come at me. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. You're going to get 10 Matt Shields exposed. That's how you know you've made it. Okay. Okay. Awesome, man. Um, awesome. So you guys weren't taking the call. So then you had to basically... You so did you have a closer from basically day one or were you so our third partner was the closer. Our third partner was the closer, and then Jared already had an agency, so he brought in a closer immediately too. So then we had two closers, and then one of my good friends who's now my roommate, I went to like middle school with him, he was a setter, and then he became a closer too. So immediately, like we had one CSM, one media buyer, and like three closers, and we just ramped up Facebook ad spend manage the sales team. We started charging painfuls. That's a golden nugget. If you guys aren't doing it now, do those painful. So instead of it's a thousand a month for six months, or instead of it's 1500 a month for six months, Hey, it's actually 6,000. If you just go ahead and pay in full for six months, when you get that 6k up front, this allows you to use because money's leverage, right? So now you can put that back into more ad spend which allows you to feed more closers, which allows you to grow faster, get more clients. It also allowed us to hire recruiters to get better talent. Dude, recruiting 
is the game. Like hiring good people and finding amazing people is the game. So getting those painfuls to hire recruiters was one of the best things we did. The philosophy that we really followed to scale was never stop selling, never stop recruiting. If you just do those two things, you scale. Never stop selling, never stop recruiting. I literally, I saw that on an Instagram post that had 12 likes and it was like, Yo, that's f- actually fucking fire, dude, who has 100 followers. Thank you for sharing that. Because then I took that. I was like, yes, never stop selling, never stop recruiting. That is the game. And Hermosi talks about this. Like He says the number one thing that they pride themselves on with an acquisition.com portfolio company is recruiting. That is the thing they do best. It's they get great people. So that's why like painfuls, you can leverage that money to hire recruiters, to find great people. When you find great people, you make more money, you keep investing the money, increase your acquisition channels to get more sales, to make more money, to hire more people, and then just keep going. And that's it. And you do that all the way up to to multi-seven figures, eight figures. We haven't gotten to eight figures, but if we just kept selling and kept recruiting, if we weren't selling the company, hopefully we'd get to eight figures within the next two years, I would hope. So that's the thought process, man. I honestly don't remember what the question was or why I got on that tangent, but I just, yeah, never stop selling, worry. never stop recruiting. Don't worry, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep reeling this in, man, because this story is <laughs> so nicely, dude. Okay, cool. So you were at that 10k. You bought in closers, and yeah. it sounds like ad, ads were like a really big part of the, like the scaling strategy, right? So 100. percent go, Going into paid ads because quite a few guys here run paid ads. Oh, sweet. So, included right so what would you like some good just like fundamental like knowledge and wisdom for like when you're looking to run paid ads what's what scale should you be at maybe like what kind of cash should you have set aside and like what kind of yeah. things can you yeah so jared and i did not pay ourselves for the first six months like we paid ourselves zero money i lived at home jared still lives at home <laughs> Fucker is 21, making 300K a month, and he lives with his mom and dad. And more power to him. Good. Do it. So we just lived as cheap as we possibly could to put everything back into paid ads. And uh, that was one of the best things we did. Yeah. As far as running paid ads, just so I could get some knowledge, can everybody put like kind of monthly revenue in the chat? Because it's really going to depend on where you guys are at. Just put, yeah, like monthly revenue in the Zoom. Cause that will depend on the paid ads 30 25 cool 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 we started running paid ads when we were at zero reese just to give like context so we did it immediately but we had obviously like cash reserves to do i will say i remember there was a month where we were negative three thousand dollars like we lost we were at 9k and we were 3k negative like our expenses we were literally anti-profitable like we were losing money because we were putting it all back into ads but it came back to us in an amazing way because we just kept planting seeds kept getting sales calls so we were this is important because this was like the hardest thing for me to do as like somebody who's super frugal i hated the idea of spending money the comp the agency i had before state ai was 23k a month revenue 21k a month profit I didn't spend on anything and I worked 70 hours a week and I busted my ass and I thought that was the way you're supposed to do it. A state AI was like literally negative until, I don't know, until Jared came in and we brought Jared on as CEO and then we actually started making some money. But even then it was like 10, 20% margin. So put as much money as you possibly can into paid ads would be my question or my answer. Put as much money as you possibly can into paid ads. As far as principles for running paid ads, I could tell you guys, but honestly, I'd rather just show you because we're selling the company. So I can basically show everything. I feel like if that's oh, cool. yeah, Matt's giving away the soul. Oh, actually, dude, our bus- I told you our business manager got hacked yesterday. So we're, I can't show you, which sucks. Oh, that's yeah, a that- fun, that's a fun problem. Your business manager getting hacked by scammers as you're trying to sell your company. That sucks. <laughs> That happened to us twice, man. They were trying to spend 80K a day on each ad account, dude. Oh, it's bad, dude. Did you get it back? We did, yeah. We did. Okay. The, second, the second time it happened, I was actually mid getting this tattoo. And then I had mm. I was in there for eight hours. And then my phone was blown up after. And then they were like, yeah, we've been hacked. But they actually, the credit to my team, they managed to like resolve like 80% of it while I was in there. That's good, dude. Yeah, yeah. I was... 
I, like yesterday, for some reason, I felt like going to surf, which I don't do in the weekdays. But I'm like, you know what? The agency's automated. Let me go try to catch some waves today. And I come back and I see a text that's, yo, where are you? We have a fire. And I'm just like, fuck, dude. The one day I try to go do something. So I learned my lesson. Don't go do things during the day. But yeah, I can still try to show our page transparency. I'll just go into the ads library. But yeah, I guess to if you could maybe dive into the question a little bit deeper, like what offers should you run or like what exact, I guess, question can I answer that would be the most valuable as far as paid ads? Yeah, I think offer would definitely be, a, I think is the place to start, right? And then just if you have any guidelines on, because to me, like ads are all, is a, is a, this is just a numbers game, right? It's if you can get those numbers to work in terms of the cost per acquisition, then essentially like you can just scale until there's no more audience to scale to if you just look at it exactly you're right so for you where we can start with offer then we can go into maybe the numbers behind it so just like people can get an idea of what to expect and like how to plan for it yeah that's another reason charging painfuls is really valuable your spin your acquisition cost really doesn't change that much so you're spending a thousand to acquire a thousand or you're spending a thousand to acquire six thousand which just makes the ads way more profitable so painfuls definitely help with just acquisition costs and all that good stuff as far as just like scaling it up the number one thing we reinvested into was paid ads and recruiters to hire team members and salespeople. it's just like that's i know it's overly simple but it's just spend more money on paid ads don't get fancy and then just hire amazing salespeople to feed the lead there's Two bottlenecks. Either you don't have enough leads for the sales team or you don't have enough sales team for the leads. So you just have to keep balancing that dichotomy as you scale. And that's the name of the game is the better you balance that, the better you scale. As far as like offer and marketing on B2B, the best thing we did was we paid Joey Yak for a rap video. And I actually will show this because I don't know what niche everybody is in, but you could do this in any niche. And I don't know if Anybody knows Joey Yak, but he basically makes these like crazy videos for Billy Jean, Jesse Itzler, and a lot of agency guys now too. So we made something called the Real Estate Rap Song. We paid Joey and he was like, yo, I'm going to make a rap song for you guys. And we're like, all right, if you say so. And he makes this rap song and we run it as a paid ad and it goes viral. And this ad, we probably spent like 100K on and it probably brought, brought back like 700K. So yeah. it's just been, this has been crazy. So Great. Picasso said, good artists create, great artists steal. Joey created this. You guys can steal this for your niche. So just don't even get too fancy with it. Literally, you can use a lot of the same language and just create it for your niche. It cost us like maybe 5K. So it was a little expensive, but worth it. Can you guys hear that? Or is it super low? No, I think it's quiet. Yeah, maybe how's that yeah go, go for it go for it sad how much i like that song bro like <laughs> <laughs> dude that is it helped that me is... to pee in the gym that's fine <laughs> dude, uh, some some uh smmo is buy rolexes others get rap songs that. like that's fuck that dude fuck my nice shit sorry for my language but bye D- dude i'm glad you talked about that i'm glad you mentioned that because it's because now that i'm selling the agency like people are asking me like yo what are you gonna buy what are you gonna buy can't think of anything i can't think of anything like i i do want a nice house i'll say that but the first thing that came to mind is maybe i'll get verified on instagram or some shit to grow like 
I want a digital Lamborghini. I don't want a Lamborghini. I want the thing that's just going to just help me grow my business. So buy paid ads, buy recruiters, buy mentorships, buy digital status that helps you in your niche. Buy the thing that's going to that's gonna help you. Don't buy the fancy stuff. It's all, it, bro, buy it once to realize how unfulfilling it is and then just don't buy it again. To, I don't know. That's my thoughts. I was just talking about this with Katari, who has a much different mindset than me. He's like, dude, like you got to buy the nice thing. And I'm like, yeah, but you have to get to the point where you really can buy the nice thing. Most people are buying Rolexes and watches when like they can't actually really be buying those yet. There's so many better places they could put that 30 grand or that 10 grand or that five grand or that thousand dollars that you spend on a nice pair of shoes. I could try to go buy a $150,000 Lambo, but there's, bro, what if I bought like some insane mentorship for 150 grand that made me a nine figure entrepreneur? I could buy as many Lambos as I want one day if I do that. So it's just like sacrifice in a financial sense is super important and it goes way deeper than people think it does. Once people get like a million, they're like, oh, I can buy stuff now. There's not that much more I could buy. But there's so many things you could buy even at a million that can take take you to a billion instead of buying a Lambo or some shit. So I know people always talk about that, but it is super important. Don't get distracted by the literal shiny object, which is what a car or a watch or any of that stuff is. Focus on investing in the things that will allow you to buy as many shiny objects as you want. And just do that until you actually can buy as many shiny objects as you want. Genuinely, like that is one of the most valuable pieces of advice I think anyone can take, particularly when you're a business owner. I was literally chatting with Charlie Morgan last night. Dude's yeah. making, did a million in sales in February. Yeah. He's wearing a 40 pound hoodie. And we were talking about Dubai and he was like, we were thinking about moving to Dubai, but then we realized like, why did we want to move to Dubai to save taxes? So what, then you can go buy a Lamborghini. He was like, I'd rather that money go into growing the business than going into my ego. I was like, Charlie's wise, bro. Because it's true. I said to him, if you go there, you go to Dubai, then what? Everyone's wearing 100K watches, driving half a million pound cars. Suddenly now you feel like you need to do that same thing. And before you know it, that black hole is just sucking up all of that. that is, you're so a hundred percent because your thoughts dictate your actions and your environment dictates your thoughts. So if you're in a certain environment for long enough, you will start to conform to the thought patterns within that environment because of adaptation. Like we are adaptive creatures. We need to adapt to our environments in order to survive. It's actually like hardwired in our DNA. So if you can just start putting yourself in an environment that is conducive with what you really want, then you'll actually be way more likely to get the thing you want. And I'm just as weird as Charlie, bro. I'm probably even, I walk around my neighborhood barefoot, like with my roommates and I walk around because I live by the beach. So I walk, I'll just walk around shirtless and like sweatpants, barefoot, like just not like I'm so against the buying the nice thing outside of a house. I will make that statement outside of the house. That, that I'm actually, I'm deciding like, okay, I could flex buying the nice thing, or I could flex being able to buy the nice thing and not. And I'd rather, if I'm going to flex one, I'd rather flex the financial discipline and the mental discipline to not buy it. Because some people like to show they have it. Other people like to know they have it. And I'd rather flex knowing than showing. That's, I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that when it comes to the financial shit. That, that, that's a TikTok clip right there. But I will say, I will say the real flex is that rap video. And Sam just said in the comments that just helped him hit a PB in the gym. So (laughs) there you go, man. That's doing more than helping (laughs) some new clients. All right. All right. Let me jump into some of these questions I've got on this this, uh, sheet. So the first one in here. Okay. This is a great first question. You're called AI, right? So the first question was how are you guys utilizing AI in the agency? Good question. This is something that I've gotten good at answering because buyers are always asked this exact same question. So we have something called Capri AI, which integrates with high level. And it's essentially dialogue flow, which is like communication patterns. So just responds to leads that come through. If a lead comes in and they say something, Capri AI, which is what a state AI, that's what our AI component is. It just responds to the leads. I'll be honest. It's not that good. It's it's not like life-changing business altering AI. It's just a nice little component that we put in because 
AI was becoming interesting, and this was way before like it really got big. We were considering taking it out of the name, but now that AI is like AI, we're just like, all right, we're, we can't change the state AI now. It's, it'd be a terrible time to change the name. But the AI is very basic. Focus on solving your client's real problems, not building micro pieces of technology that don't really solve. Only build the technology if it's really going to solve the main problem. I, if going back, we wouldn't even have wasted the time on the AI. It's probably net done more negative than it has positive because it was just a distraction and now we have to manage the AI and it doesn't really do anything. So the AI is very basic, very, it's very basic. It, yeah. Got it, man. No, that that's actually super, super valuable hearing that from you, dude, because we were looking at, I forget the name of the, uh, that software. I think Alex Hormozzi promoted it. It does like the video AI. Yeah. Josh, do you remember the name of that software? But whatever it's called, but I, I think you guys know what I mean, right? It can like change the person's name and no, not Alan. Uh, it might be Steve. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> any, any, I know okay. what you're talking about where like you record the video and then it can like say whatever you want it to say, or it can say, Hey, Harry, I saw you booked an appointment. Or, and then it can also say, Hey, Connor, I saw you like that software. Yeah. Have you like, yes, sir. Promoted it too. Kind of nah. So we just looked into it. We had our automation specialist make a report on like, how can we automate things in the company via AI technology? And we just go over every department and all the things we can do. And he found some cool stuff. But part of me is also don't get distracted by AI. Don't get, it's a sh another shiny object. It's just like paper show was a shiny object. It's just like TikTok ads were a shiny object. Everybody was like TikTok ads. And our, literally our whole team was like, yo, when are we going to start doing TikTok ads? And I was just like, dude, not right now, <laughs> because we're still getting better at Facebook and Instagram. And that's still our focus in the book. Good to great, which I probably have somewhere. It's that big one up there. Very good book written by a guy named Jim Collins. He says, what is the number one thing that your company has potential to be the best in the world at? For us, it wasn't going to be TikTok ads. It's not going to be AI technology. It's going to be community and coaching. It's one thing. What is the one thing that if you put all your time into, you have potential to be the best in the world at? And then every other thing you have to look at as taking you away from being the best in the world. So we didn't do TikTok ads. We didn't do paper show. We did the AI shit and I regret it. I would have rather put that time and money into doing the coaching and consulting sooner. So we don't do a lot of the AI stuff. We're looking into it because we have a wizard who... Like he can just put all his time into focusing on it. So we don't have to. And if he can, cool. If it saves us some time, but we're not like trying to make our business an AI ran business. We're not that bullish on it yet. Got you. Yeah. It's, it, I feel like it's this fine balance because I'm basically of a similar mindset to you with all the shiny objects. But yeah. then at the same time, guys like Surge promote, run a TikTok agency and then he sells X number of units in that. I feel like one of the things I've noticed is that we've even had clients leave who were like our best clients who got obscene results because they just wanted to try something new that was pitched to them as like a that shiny new thing. I don't know if that ever happens to, to you guys. That might be like a floor sure. process. But so then it's at the same time, I feel like we're trying to find this balance between doing what we know actually moves the needle but then also keeping it exciting like for example you said with the uh, like the lottery thing and stuff like that so we're how do you think about it in ter in terms of that like in terms of staying fresh whether it's ai or something else like how do you keep kind of clients yeah. excited? In innovation is important but you just need to make sure you're innovating on the thing you have potential to be the best in the world at so it's if it's not di direct to the main thing probably not worth innovating on. So once you define your thing, like what are we going to be the best? What do we have potential to be the best? Make it more realistic. What do we have potential to be the best in the market at? And then innovation should solely be around that thing. Yeah. And it's like AI is not the thing we're going to be the best in the world at. So we're not really going to innovate on our AI. Yeah, I remember you saying like a similar thing when I asked you about the SaaS model as well. Yeah. That. I hate SaaS. <laughs> I hate SaaS. Joel, Joel and I were talking. Joel, Joel made a really good video on this. 
Like leads are, Hermosi talks about this. Leads are commoditized. Leads are a commodity. Leads are, anybody can get leads. All a SaaS agency is a more efficient way to provide the commodity that is leads. But if you want to build a sustainable business that has potential to be the best in the market, if you want to build something great, you have to solve the real problem. And the real problem for a chiropractor, for a real estate agent, for a gym owner, for a dentist, the real problem is not that they can't get leads. The real problem is they don't know how to run a dental practice or scale a chiropractic office or build a gym. Like that is the real problem. They don't know how to run their business. If they did, they would know how to get leads. That is just one asset of running a business. So a SaaS doesn't solve the real problem. That's why I don't like it. And it's not sustainable. It's a quick, cheap way to make maybe 5K a month, but you're not going to build a $5 million company building a SaaS agency. So like why wait and like delay? Because eventually you're going to want to build a $5 million company. So why not just start doing it now? That's my thoughts on SaaS at least. That leads nicely into the next question I've got here, which is what does the future of the agency industry look like to you? More and more towards education. I really think hybrid is the future of the agency model because leads are becoming easier and easier to get. So the people who can build in communities, like communities have been around. The thing about communities is like, we're talking about sustainability. Communities have been around since people were in the world. Like religion is a community. Like, G like Jesus was the leader of that community and it's around till this day. So like if you can build a community of people, that is where things get sticky. And I think that's where the agency model goes is towards communities because it is the name of the game in agency is recurring revenue. And in order to create recurring revenue, you have to have something that's sticky. In order to have something that's sticky, you have to provide something that people don't want to leave. People will leave you for the shiny object if you don't have something that makes them want to stay. But communities are very hard to leave because we are tribal creatures. Like the psychology of community is actually very fascinating. If you look back thousands and thousands of years ago, people hunted in tribes and they wanted to stay in the tribe. The idea of leaving the tribe, and that's why human beings are all like, we're tribal creatures till this day. Are you left? Are you right? Are you pro this? Are you anti that? Like we're tribal creatures till this day because tribes make us feel safe. And so thousands and thousands of years ago, if you got kicked out of the tribe, you had to hunt by yourself. And you had to fend for yourself from all the other enemy tribes by yourself alone. It was much harder to survive when you got kicked out of the tribe thousands and thousands of years ago. So in our DNA is this primitive fear that if we get kicked out of the tribe, we won't be able to survive. And because of that, if you can make a tribe of people, the people are not going to want to leave the tribe because they literally feel like they're less likely to survive. However, we can master the psychology of building a tribe and making it literally a scary thing to leave, that's what we want to do. It's not scary to leave leads. It's scary to leave a community where you feel like you belong. So that's where I think the space is going. And that's where I think business is going. Communities around the business. That's the name of the game. Whether it's SaaS, like legit SaaS, not high-level SaaS, like actual software companies. Look at the best ones. They have communities built around them. The best brands have communities built around them. The best companies have communities built around them. So it's communities, it's coaching. That's what I think the future is. Love that, bro. Got, got a good next question here is, and it might be the same thing, but what would you do if you had to start out again in, in agency? I do the same exact thing. I just would have done it sooner. The state AI, I haven't found a better way to build it. There's, I'm sure there's things we could do better. I would have gotten into a bigger market quicker. I started in gyms. Gyms were good. Gyms were pretty, I mean, Gym Launch is a $50 million company. They're going to be a quarter of a billion. So gyms were fine, but I would have just really made sure I was in a big market and I would have started consulting way sooner. I also would have got a good business partner way sooner. I hated sales. Like I actually hate talking to people. I used to, I don't like speaking that over myself now, but like, I was very introverted. I didn't like talking to people. So I was very bad at sales. 
and I wasn't good enough at overcoming the fear to, to get to the level of success I needed to. Now I like sales. I enjoy it, but I didn't then. So finding a business partner who was really good at it, that's why Steady Eye skyrocketed. He didn't like client success. He didn't like product. So his last agency was like, my partner, Jared, scaled to 100K a month, but fulfillment was shit. And it's just like, he just literally sold the business to people on his team because he was just like, I can't do this anymore. But he knew how to get to 100K a month. I didn't know how to get to 100K a month, but I knew how to keep 90% retention for my small agency. So combining our forces together, that took us to a higher level. Because again, you're limited by the intellectual capacity of your team, of your business. And in the beginning, it's just you. So you're limited by your own intellectual capacity. So you have to find somebody who knows way more than you in a certain thing to grow the capacity of your intellect. And that grows the company. So finding a business partner, getting in a big market, and doing the consulting and done with you community. Dude, if I started doing that four years ago, a steady I would be 10 million, 20 million, 20 million dollar a year business. Easy. You live and you learn. I love that, man. Do you know, dude, like I was uh, speaking to Joss, like you've inspired us to to look into the US market, right? And I'll tell you that, and this is good for everyone else, right? I always had this limiting belief that we wouldn't be able to serve the US market because I'm not an American. And then you told me that one of your best closers was a guy in top uh, guy. Yeah. And top I, and guy I, is British. Top guy. Dude. He's so, our top guy is British. Our second gal is American. Our third gal is Canadian. No, it doesn't matter. I love that, man. Yeah. I, I think it's like when you're outside of America and America is the biggest market, it can sometimes feel like a little bit daunting to go into, but just take this. I had this limiting belief for such a long time, which has just stopped us from scaling. And I got to a point, I was saying this, that I realized like all of my friends who had the biggest agencies were all serving the US market. And I was like, why, mm. aren't, why aren't we serving the freaking US market? But, but there's also so many more agencies in the US. There's a lot of opportunity in UK, like Australia, like Canada, bro. Canada is a blue, like that's another thing. I wish it, I guess I wish I would have done sooner is pivot into Canada because you can get leads like B2B leads so cheap in Canada and they buy dude, like they're buyers. So Canada, blue ocean, I don't care what niche you're in. There's opportunity in Canada for sure. I still wish we should, we should have been doing that a long time ago, focused on other stuff, I guess. I guess, I guess it's all relative. Cause like, uh, we've started running ads and like, we're getting calls booked for like less than like 10 pounds. Like, yeah. Bro, what are they in the US? I imagine like five, 10x that probably. Like 70 bucks. When we started, it was 35. But as you scale, like the entropy of scaling ads, it just, it makes the cost more expensive. So it's probably like 70 bucks an appointment now, 50, 50 on a good day. It's probably like 60, 70. Got you. So dude, you're getting $10 appointments. Yeah. Bro, the, I like, why would you come over to my $70 appointments? You can get seven appointments for one appointment for me. You just got to get better at converting those appointments. Ten dollar oh, appointments is nuts, dude. Is there's quite a few guys. One of the guys in here, Giacomo, he's actually in Thailand at the moment, so he can make it. He's getting them for I think seven or eight euros. I think his cost per acquisition is two fifth, two twenty five euros. CPA. Bro, give me a two twenty five cost per acquisition. <laughs> Come on, that's crazy. That's our cost per acquisition is like probably twelve hundred. Is that just based on ads or is that including like commissions and stuff like that? That's just ads. Got you. That's just ads. Commissions, we pay our closers very well. We have closers that make 20, 25K a month, just commissions. So yeah, after closing, it's probably like 2,000 for an 8K you. package. And then you talked a bit about backend deals as well. I think that's hmm. that's something that I was just missing that totally and i think and this could be valuable for the guys here because the thing is like we did we do we've got we've had clients for like nearly three years so not, awesome. not all of them, but we've had some of them right and so we just every year i come around and was like hey do you want to do another year they're like yep this is an easy transaction so how do you how do you approach that if you want to upsell a client what's the best way to do that yeah i can walk through that process but i want to i think preface it with don't start selling back-end offers until you've mastered selling front-end offers. Don't sell back-end offers at 20K a month. 
we didn't start selling back end offers until 200k a month. So yeah. we really like focus is we're really very big on what's the most important thing we should do right now. And it wasn't back end offers until we had a really excellent product on the front end and until we had a really good process for selling the excellent product. I'll be honest, I can answer this question but I don't think it's the question that I should answer right now. If you guys are at like 10, 20, 30, I wouldn't even focus on back end offers yet. Cool. Wouldn't even Not I'd love I'll come back when somebody hits 50k a month or whatever, we'll make a metric and I'd love to come back and talk about like the back end offers, but I wouldn't even focus on it yet. To be honest. But that that leads nicely onto another question, which is why do you think most agency owners fail to just take off? To take off or to succeed at all? The question says to take off. So you can I take that as it's a really just get traction. Maybe they've got like a client or two, but then to really get past that stage. It 100% has to do with their mind. It's either a belief or a thought pattern that is breaking you up. Everybody asks like, how do I scale my business? How do I grow my business? How do I grow my business? It's the wrong question. The question is, how do I grow myself to be able to grow the business? And I know that's woo. I get it. Like people talk about talk about that all the time. But if you knew how to grow the business, you would grow the business. So the question is like, how do I grow myself? What is the thing that is breaking me from being able to scale the business? It's not, it's not like, how do you grow your business? It's how do you grow yourself? And uh, for me personally, what was holding me back was lack of understanding how to invest money. I was running a 90% profit agency, which I thought was cool. So I was holding on to all my money. That was a huge mistake. And it was one of the biggest beliefs I had to break. The second thing, I was scared of sales calls and it took me way too long to start selling because when I started selling, I was actually really good at it. I don't know if any of you guys are introverts, but introverts can actually be amazing salespeople, like amazing salespeople because they're really introspective and they have a deep understanding of psychology because introvert by definition is the combination of two words intra invert, which means to turn within. So like you're constantly turning within as an introvert. So you really have a deep psychological understanding of yourself, which a lot of times transfers on sales calls. So if I realized that sooner, I would have taken my introverted ass and I would have hopped on sales calls. I would have started closing deals, but it took me too long to do that. And then the third thing is I didn't realize how important it was to hire a team. So I didn't invest money. I let my fears dictate my actions. And I didn't hire a team to support me because I wanted to do it all myself because deep down I was really scared that I was going to let down the people I brought onto the team. That was probably the fear really is. I don't want to bring you onto my team because I don't believe in myself enough to do. So fear was the thing that really held me back. I don't want to project that onto everybody else, but it's something to think about. What fears are holding me back from getting to where I want to go? Because that's what it was deeply rooted for me. A fear of money, a fear of failure or fear of all these things like fear was actually now that i'm talking about it it was actually the thing that was holding me back it's not that i didn't know how to run facebook ads and serve clients and set, like i knew how to do it i was just scared so that's what it was for me it deeply rooted fear at the end of the day how did you overcome it i put myself in a position where i didn't have a choice like i made a video about newton's first law i don't know if anybody watches my YouTube videos at all, but it's like the second video I made was Newton's first law and object in motion stays in motion. And an object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So there's a lot of parallels between science, psychology, and success. And I was an object at rest, staying in rest, which is the law of inertia, which by definition means a tendency to do nothing or remain unchanged. I was remaining unchanged because I was an object at rest, because by Newton's law, I hadn't been acted upon by an unbalanced force. I didn't have a necessity to grow. Like I, I need, it needs to be an unbalancing force because when your comfort is more of an important force than your desire to grow, it will always be the unbalancing force that keeps you stagnant. So for me, what happened, I guess we'll get a little deep, but for me, what happened is like, when I first got into building my marketing agency, my parents gave me 10 months. I was 17. Like I, I was literally starting my senior year of online high school. I was 17 years old. And they're like, you have 10 months to either make money with this or we're kicking you out. 
And it was the best thing they did for me because I felt like it was literally life or death to figure out how to succeed in these next 10 months. Because if I didn't figure out a way to, to make it work, I was on the edge of not wanting to be here anymore. And like, I was extremely depressed. Like I would have done some shit that really would have been sad. So I felt like it was my only fucking possible way. Like it's the only way for me to survive is if I figure out how to do this. When it becomes like I either do this or I die, you fucking do it. Like you just do it and you don't care. I picked up the phone and I cold called and I was like sweating. I was shaking. I was so scared, but I did it. I did the team meetings because I had to. I talked to the clients because I had to, because in the back of my mind, there's this idea that if I don't, I'm going to die. And like when it's life or death, you just do the thing you need to do. So the question is, if you don't have deeply rooted trauma like me, you're lucky. <laughs> That's a good thing. But how do you still leverage your fears on a deep enough level to take the actions you need to take? Whether it's sales calls, hiring, managing team, whatever the thing is, the thought process that I like to put into perspective is if I had a incurable disease, if I was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, my doctor calls me up and he's, you're going to die in 30 days. You're going to die in 30 days. Like your life is over 30 days from this call right now. And the only way to cure the disease, the only way to survive is if you add $10,000 to whatever you made last month, this month. So if you made 10K last month, your life is over if you don't make 20K this month. If you can put yourself in that perspective and you start to think, what would I do differently if my life was literally going to be over 30 days from now? If I never got to wake up again, I never got to see my mom. I never got to experience the world. I never got to think again. I just never woke up. If I didn't add 10K in the next 30 days, what would I do differently? And when you think about that, you can immediately diagnose the things you're doing wrong. Um, bullshit and too much wasting time on social media. I'm not taking sales calls. I'm not doing the thing I know I need to do because it's uncomfortable. But if my life was on the line, I would just fucking do it. So if you can really imagine yourself in that situation of if I don't achieve this goal, my life is over and you make that commitment to yourself and you start living in a way that is in accordance to success, literally being life or death, your actions change completely and you start doing the things you know you need to do because it's a big enough deal and it's an unbalancing force to get you into motion. And once you do that, an object in motion stays in motion and you get the law of momentum and you just keep fucking going. Because once I got the first 10K, I was so outside of my comfort zone. I was just like, all right, I got to keep going. And it's just been complete comfort zone breaking since then. Like first time doing an interview, I was like 19. I was like, I'm going to interview somebody. What the fuck? This is weird. Then it was like, now I got to manage a team. I got to do a team meeting. People are going to hop on and listen to me and I'm paying them money and I'm their leader. Like what? Like, it's just, we did the team retreat. I got to meet these people in person. It's just been consistently breaking limiting beliefs and overcoming fear. But I did it on the micro level and I got into motion and that built momentum. So if you can just start now, you'll get into motion and then momentum will take over. It's literally science and you'll just keep going. But you got to make a decision. And I think you have to view it as life or death to make it a big enough deal. And if you don't want to view it as life or death, you might just not want it bad enough. I know it sounds Gary V ish, but like you might just like, why you don't need to get to 20K a month. You don't need to get to 30K a month. Nobody's making you do it. Who told you need to get to 30K a month to be happy? Who told you need to build a seven figure business to be happy? You don't. But if you're going to set out to do it, you got to actually fucking commit to it. Otherwise, you're just going to have a desire that you're never going to have the actions to match and that's going to make you miserable. People see a Lamborghini and they're like, oh, I want a Lamborghini but they wake up every day and they watch fucking porn and then they go eat shitty food and they don't do anything. And it's no, you don't want a Lamborghini and you're just making yourself miserable because you're telling yourself you want a Lamborghini and you're not taking the actions that are in accordance to getting a fucking Lambo. So either don't want the Lambo in the first place or do what's required to get the Lambo. And for me, I just felt like if I don't care about a Lambo or any of that shit, it's just, I need to do this to survive. So it was a no brainer for me. So could dive into it deeper, but that's what made me get out of my comfort zone, which oh, made that. me grow my business.
I, th I think that was pretty deep, man. I, pre I appreciate you, uh, you going there, man. And I think it's either one of the two things, right? It's the fear and the desperation or it's the inspiration, right? It, those yeah. are the two primary driving forces. Yeah, Josh said burn the boats. What, he actually got a freaking tattoo on his chest to show that he like literally like the burn the gun. Show, show the tattoo. Was it oh, that's fire. What it's is it? Like, basically, have you heard the story about burn the boats? Basically, there was a guy back in the dark ages or whatever was leading his army to take over an island and they were outnumbered 10 to 1 when they arrived and they were pretty much all gonna they were fucked they were gonna die so then he told his army to go ahead and burn the boats so they had no option but to either take the fucking island or die that was their yes. only two options and they ended up taking the island it's bro i love it that's amazing the i've heard a similar story jfk told this when he was trying to get on the moon, when we were trying to land on the moon, he told this story of throwing your hat over the wall. And he told this story of his grandfather who grew up in Ireland. Every day they would walk home and they would try to climb these walls. They would try to climb these walls. Him and his school schoolyard friends would try to climb over these walls. And one day they got to a wall that was so tall, they were too scared to do it. And they didn't want to climb over the wall. So what they did is they took their hats that their mothers knitted for them for their school uniforms and they threw the hat over the wall because they knew they would not go home unless they returned with their hat because what their moms would do to them if they came home without the hat that their moms knitted for them is not pleasant. So they threw their hat over the wall so the only way they could go home is if they retrieved the hat. And the only way to retrieve the hat was to climb the fucking wall. And so they climbed the wall they force their success by throwing their hat over the wall. How can you in your life right now throw your hat over the wall so the only way to come home is to actually get the hat back and to succeed? Like, how can you do it? And it's there's not an easy answer. I can't give you the answer. It's going to have to be personal to you. But what is your hat and where can you throw it so you have to succeed? Yeah, I think as well, like to add to that, it's so powerful. And I've been experiencing this myself. It's so powerful when you can be around other people who are yes. actually doing the same thing as you. My buddy, Caleb, who I work with, we share an office together. It's his 25th birthday today, and he's just started a new company. And he's all in 15 hours a day. I said, dude, I want to give you this cake today. He's like, sorry, man, I literally won't have time. I drove to where he was in a taxi with this cake, and he had four minutes to have a bite of it with me before getting on his next call. And he was like, dude, there's nothing I'd rather be doing right now than building this company. And I was like, Frick. can you imagine like the, effect? if your goal is to grow, having people around you and like in this community, right? Of people who are just getting after it. Like the, yes, the, you're like to me now, work doing like putting in 10 hours, I feel like I'm slacking off because I know that he's going to be there before me. But it's the key with this is that you can do it from a healthy perspective. If you're not in that stage, where you are physically, you know, you're going to get thrown out of your house. Then the question is, okay, how do you recreate that in a healthy way? And you can absolutely do that, right? Just by choosing to be surrounded by people who have that same mindset. And then actually yeah. the beauty of this is, and again, I was speaking to Charlie about this. He was like, it's mostly inspiration, which is the driver, but there's that healthy fear. He said he has this anxiety that people are going to come and create something better than him. And that is that 20% that just keeps him driven. And I think it's healthy to have a bit of both, right? And I think we we tend to want to avoid the fear, the more dense emotions, because they don't feel good to feel. I think particularly as men, we can use those as fuel. And we it's, it's, go ahead. If I could just add on to that, we wouldn't be on this Zoom call if people didn't feel fear. And what I mean by that is like thousands and thousands of years ago, we lived in caves and then we got scared. We were going to be attacked by animals. So we built huts and then we got scared of storms. So we built nicer huts and then eventually we built houses. And like the only reason any innovative thing has been created is from some sort of fear. So like we, we made microphones and we made laptops and we made cars because we were scared that the other things weren't going to be enough. That's why we keep making all these nicer things. So a little bit of fear to build something great, it's a requirement. Like the study that Sam Ovens talked about, the three common traits of ultra successful people. Have you guys heard, has everybody seen like Hermosi talk about this? The three common traits. Basically, he's, there's three things. 
people, the ultra successful people have three things in common. Number one, they have a superiority complex. They feel like they're entitled to more. They feel like they deserve more for some reason. They feel like they deserve more from life. And so thus they go after more. The second thing is they're deeply insecure. They feel like no matter what they do, it will never be enough. And so thus they always do more. They feel entitled to more, but they don't think it's enough. So they just keep going. And then the third thing is they are extremely disciplined and they don't waver. They have emotional control and they focus. So those are like the three common traits of the most successful people in the world. So if you're having a little bit of insecurity, you have a little bit of anxiety, good, fucking good. It's a good thing. I think we lost Ibrahim. We can keep going. Does it, does anybody have any questions? I know we've been going down like the, oh, he's back. Cool. I know we were going deep into the mindset stuff. And I do think that stuff is really important because your mind determines your actions, which determines where you go. As Ibrahim says, says, internal state equals external reality, reality, right? I'm catching on to that one. It's true. It's true. Whatever is going on in your mind is going to determine how you act and how you act is going to determine where you go, which determines who you become. So that's why I go so deep into the mindset stuff. And it's just been a journey for me because if you guys could have met me just a couple years ago, even after I already had 10, 20K a month, I still was like so fucked up in the mind and in the head. And like I had so many problems that I had to overcome in my own head that just seeing firsthand how I've been able to change literally who I am as a person by changing my thoughts. I can't think of a more powerful thing in this world than changing your thoughts. The greatest superpower we have is our ability to transform the way we think. That's, that's the greatest superpower we have. Jeff Bezos doesn't become Jeff Bezos because he was Jeff Bezos when he was born. He transformed his thoughts and he became the richest man in the world. And then Elon transformed his thoughts better and became richer than him. It's like, that, that's the game transforming your thoughts anyway i'd love to i guess answer like somebody's specific question on whatever's like in your guys mind if that's cool ibrahim just like somebody on the call if there's a specific tactical question or like a a specific question you're struggling with in your own agency because you guys have been on here for almost 90 minutes had question above okay how do you still make strong profit despite paying media buyer closers etc high amounts is it high retainers good question how do we still create good profits. I would worry about that question once you're at 50K a month. Like I wouldn't even really worry about your profits outside of being able to cover your living expenses until you're at like 50, 100K a month. How do we still maintain good profits? Some months we don't. We just did a team retreat in Costa Rica. We just spent like $20,000 to take our team to Costa Rica and ball out. We took them to the clubs. We had a we bought the house that used to be owned by the family that started Volkswagen. So like we paid for this insane fucking literally Volkswagen house. And uh, like that hurt our margins, dude. We had 20% margins last month, but our team is going to be with us for a lifetime. So like some months we don't make good margins because we're running the marathon, not the sprint. And that's the game. It's a marathon, not a sprint if you really want to do it. So with that being said, you still need margin to succeed in business. Really, how do we do it? We have very efficient systems. So we're able to get more output from less people. We are relentless in what we expect from our team. So if somebody's not pulling their weight, they're not on the team. Thus, everybody does more and they feel compelled to do more, which makes us more efficient. And we have a higher profit per head because of that. We charge a decent amount. We introduced a back-end offer which helped our margins a lot, but we only got to do that because we mastered the things we talked about first. And we just, yeah, man, just find people, expect the most of them because you project the most from yourself and that will make your people more efficient and thus they do more. Like our media buyers manage 100 accounts each. We have one head coach responsible for 200 clients and then he has two customer service reps below him who manage a hundred clients each and people when I just saw Joshua and Ibrahim's face go, the fuck? <laughs> it was like, hold on how much? And it's dude, the reason is because it's actually really, really possible. There was a week where I had to manage all 200 clients myself with no reps, no nothing. It was like two week period. I had to do every cancellation call. I had to respond to every email. I had to do, I bro, I actually did it really easily because like I just had to. And so like people, it goes back to this comfort thing. People 
have no idea what they're actually capable of. So yeah, if you limit them, dude, when our CSM started, our CSMs only managed 30 clients. Our CSMs, before we had reps, were managing 100 clients each with the same work schedule, with the same amount of hours per week. Like it's fat, it's fascinating what people do and are capable of when they get in a position where they're forced to do it, to go back to exactly what we were talking about with Newton's first law. What were they going to do? Not manage the clients? No, they had to. They would have lost their jobs if they didn't. And we would have lost the business. So they just figured out a way to make it work. So I don't know. Sometimes I just think about managing a hundred clients. Your guys' eyebrows just went up. Like that was a crazy thing. Keep in mind, people have like literally flown rocket ships into space. <laughs> managing a hundred SMA clients is fucking nothing, bro. <laughs> like we've created rocket ships that fly into, I can't even begin to think about that. I can't manage a hundred realtors over email and a couple of calls. It's like it, the perspective, bro. It's perspective. So get more out of your people. You'll make more margin. If you don't have results or testimonials yet, what would be your offer to get new clients in your real estate agent? I would work for free. I don't know your guys' thoughts on that, if that's contrary to what you guys talk about, but I would have worked for free. We did a ton of free trials. We followed something called the popcorn effect when we started with gyms, and we just planted tons of free trials with gyms. And eventually, after four months of free trials, we're at 20K a month because trial by fire, like the best way to learn something is to actually go out and do it. What did your day-to-day -day look like in the beginning stages of a steady eye? What were your priorities? Very good question, Connor. Thank you for asking. What was your day-to-day -day in the beginning of a state AI? So I was focused on getting people to do the things that I was doing. So I was focused on training a media buyer. I was focused on training a CSM. And then I was focused on getting the infrastructure to be able to scale the company to 100K a month, 150K a month. So like project management systems like getting monday.com set up is a very boring thing, but like getting our, pro we've used monday.com till this day from 50 clients to 250 clients. We're just using monday.com. So getting that system set up and it's the same exact way we set it up a year ago. So that actually ended up being a very high ROI activity, but really dude, it was just recruiting people and training people to replace my day to day. So then I could go focus on bigger picture ideas and make decisions that were higher leverage. Like the decision to create a community is a decision most agency owners never come to because they're too bogged down in the client ads and the client emails. So like they never even have the freedom in their mind to think, oh, we should build a community. Once I offloaded my time, I automated my time, I was able to have the freedom to make decisions that allowed us to actually go to like multi seven figures, which was like build a community or let's buy these innovative new ads. So I had to free up my mental space. I had to free up my thoughts. It's not even time that you want to free up. It's thoughts. You want to have enough capacity to take on new thoughts and have innovative ideas that will give you five, 10, 20 X returns on your time, not two X returns on your time. So just replacing people from the day to day and immediately getting out of that. So I could focus on bigger picture stuff. That was my day-to-day -day in the beginning. That's my day-to-day -day now. Did you say you got a CSM around 30 clients originally? Yeah. The founder, the original founder did it all himself first. And then, yeah, like around 20, probably it was like 20 clients, 25 clients. We got a CSM. One of the best hires you can make in the beginning, dude. A really good CSM. So important. So important. What kind of attributes do they need to have to be successful? Love this question. I've thought about this because we have an amazing fucking CSM. Like our head coach is awesome. And I've also hired a lot of not awesome CSMs. I've made plenty of mistakes with CSMs. They are hard. The number one thing is somebody, and it, it's simple, but overlooked is do they have a burning desire to satisfy people? Do they have a burning desire to make people feel good almost to the point where they're like insecure about letting people down. Like somebody who is that service oriented, they're like, I just love people and I want to be there for them. They're going to do whatever it takes to make them happy and they're going to figure it out. So our head CSM, he's a very empathetic guy. We literally do empathy tests with every CSM that comes in. We test it and he had the 95 percentile score. 
I'm not the biggest fan of behavior tests, but when I talked to him, it was very clear he was an empathetic, caring guy, and he really gave a shit. He really gave a shit. And uh, he was not, we almost didn't hire him. We almost didn't hire him because he wasn't, hate the YouTuber shit, dude, hate the lights, but I have a weird like shadow, so I had to put it on. We almost didn't hire him because he was not very, he wasn't extremely assertive and we wanted a coach. He did a role play and it was like one of the worst role plays I've actually ever done. He was like, I was like, I'm canceling your lead suck. What do you do? And he's, I'm sorry that you, I'm sorry that the lead suck. He just, it was really bad. It was really bad, but he had the core value that we needed, which was, he actually gave a fuck. That is one of our core values at a state AI actually give a fuck. And this guy actually did. And he became a coach now, dude, if you listen to one of his cancel calls, he's what do you mean? The lead suck. Why did this person close those leads? Why am I literally using the system and I'm closing my own leads from the system? He's like, no, the leads don't suck. Your follow-ups suck. And he's like eat 180 from his first role play. So there's two ways to create talent. You can buy talent or you can build talent. So you can buy people who have like actually done the thing already and are overqualified probably for your company, but you invest in them. Or you can find the people who have potential and you can build. And when you're starting off, you really need to take the ladder because why would a talented person come to you? You like you probably don't have enough money to really buy a talented person. You probably don't have enough experience or credibility to where they're going to want to work for you. So you got to find those sleepers that have a lot of potential that you can build into amazing people. And he had the core traits, the core values, the character traits that would make up a great CSM, which is he actually cared. He was empathetic. And he was very good at listening and talking to people. That was it. Dude, you said about the cancellation call. Can you run me through that? Because that's not something we yeah. have or like offer. How does that work? Like doing a cancellation call with a client? Is it, so I understand that basically when a client wants to finish, you schedule in this call to like board them, right? Is that? It's when a client wants to cancel. What it is essentially. Yeah, it's like, it was like if a client's two months in and I don't like this anymore and they want to cancel or maybe it's the end of their contract or whatever, anytime they want to leave, right? Like anytime they're like, I'm done with your service or I want to be done with your service. In the beginning, that's all we trained our CSMs on because it was a mess and we had a lot of them. Now we don't even really, we don't even role play cancellation calls because it's not the most important thing anymore, which is good. But basically the cancellation call framework is when a client is upset and they send you that email and they're like, look, like, Jaden, I want to cancel, man. I'm done, but I'm not getting results. What we do is we will literally make a Google doc and we do something called an accusations audit. And we'll say, what is every potential reason this client is going to want to cancel our service? What is every potential accusation they're going to throw at us? I didn't like your leads. I didn't convert your leads. Your communication was bad. My Facebook ad account got disabled. What like every single singular granular thing. And then when we hop on the call with them, we're just like, Hey, Jaden, thanks for hopping on this call with me. Is it cool if we just dive right into it? Sure, let's dive into it. Cool. Is it fair if I just give my kind of understanding of where you're at and then you can tell me what I have right, what I have wrong? Because people love to correct you. So if you open it that way, they'll always say yes. I was like, okay, cool. So based off just our experience, our relationship so far, where I'm feeling like you're at, if I had to guess, is X, Y, and Z thing. You, you started with us and you really wanted to get 10 deals in your first month or you really want to get 10 new clients in your first month, or you really wanted 30 leads in your first month, you're probably pretty frustrated because we're only at 20 leads so far and it's been a month and a half. You're also probably pretty frustrated because the Facebook ad account got disabled and then you had to fix that. And th that was pretty annoying. And th I do, I completely get it. On top of that, you're blah, blah, blah. And we just said every potential thing. Is that kind of a fair spot of where you're at right now, Jaden? And it's just like, you took all of the wind out of their sale. And now- this client who was going to tell you, Ibrahim, I didn't get my lead. I didn't close the deal. I didn't. You just said all of it. And they're like, oh, like you actually do know what's going on. Like Eminem in 8 Mile. That's exactly it. It's the, <laughs> We literally call it Slim Shady Method. We That's the, how we train our team. It's like, guys, we're going over the Slim Shady today. And the like new CSMs will be like, Slim Shady? And then the other CSMs will laugh and they'll be like, oh, yeah. And then we'll literally play the 8 Mile rap battle for them. I'll be like, what the fuck is this? And it's like, dude, Eminem literally said, I am white. I am a chum. I am a fucking bum. I do live in a trailer with my mom. I do have a boy future named Uncle Tom or whatever. Like he said everything. 
He's like, no, everything this fucker is about to say against me. Like, he, that's literally what he said. And then the fucker had nothing to say against him. So he like <laughs> didn't take the mic because he had nothing left to say. And so when you, and you can do this in anything. You can do this with team. You can do this with relationships. You can do this with women. You can do this with whatever you want. Take the wind out of the sail. It takes all of uh, their momentum away from them. And it gives them a chance to actually listen to you because you've shown they under, you show you understand them. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They don't care what you understand until they feel understood. So once you show you understand them, they will be open to what else you might understand. And then they'll actually listen. And then you just say, hey, I remember you wanted 30 leads in the first month. But remember back to our first call, we said sometimes the first month or two is a lot of testing. It's a lot of tracking. And we don't always get the momentum we want in the beginning. Just like Sarah, one of our most successful clients, she didn't get her first deal until three months in, but now she's getting two deals a month. So do you think that it's possible for us to still get to X, Y, and Z goal, whatever their dream goal is? Is it? Do you think it's still possible for us to get to three deals a month if Sarah was able to get there too and she started off in the same position you are? So stories are also very powerful. Use a client who's actually been in the same spot. Stories sell way better than anything else. Slim Shady to a story you'll save your clients. We got very, we have way too much data, more data than I would like on cancellation calls, but we got very good at it. Dude, that, that is super freaking valuable, man. Thanks for sharing that. So do yeah. you have that as like, is that like contractually in there or like, how do you get that to them to take that call? Do you just say, Hey, let's just hop on the call to talk about it. Or is there like a, the cancel? Yeah, there, they have that, to do it. They, <laughs> Yeah, good question. Sorry, it was cutting out a little bit. I think I interrupted you, but they uh, they have to contractually take an exit interview in order to leave the program. Otherwise, they can't leave. So they have to do an exit interview. Most of them will just do it anyway because we're building good relationships with people. Like they'll do us the decency of hopping on a call. I can keep Go going, ahead. but I have to pee. So I know we're like an hour and forty minutes in. I'm down to keep. I'm down to keep going, but I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> No, dude, I'll, I'll, dude, I was gonna just start wrapping this up at ninety minutes. Anyway, okay. man, it's been, cool. it's been. I'm chugging yeah, water this been, as well. Yeah, dude, this has been so freaking valuable. I just want to thank you, and guys, if you want to cool. just take yourselves off mute for a moment, you can, yeah, just share how this was, and like maybe yeah, take a moment to thank Matt. Yeah, no, thanks for coming on, man. This is so sick. Like, definitely very valuable. I could literally listen to you all day, man. Literally, yeah, I appreciate it, dude. Man. Thank you for listening, dude. I appreciate you. Yeah, th thanks, Matt. I used to watch you. I saw you in Jeff Miller's group ages ago. Yeah. And it's crazy to see how far you come because, wow. yeah, it's inspiring, actually, because, yeah, I think we were all in a very similar position with our agencies. And, uh, yeah, it's just good to see that someone that I used to see actively in there just blowing up so much and, yeah, got a lot of value from this, like, a lot. So thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That was the man. I remember those group days. I remember those good yeah, days good. going in there, posting, posting. It's still good to this day, but. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been in in a minute, but yeah. No, I, re I remember that, man. It's uh, yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy. But I, that, I don't know. That brought back a lot of nostalgia. Thinking of Facebook groups and I don't know, being in like Rob Quinn's Facebook group and like trying to learn. And it's crazy, man. Learn from people who have been where you want to go. Surround yourself with really good people. And uh, yeah, just keep going in the popcorn popcorn pops I built five agencies to 20k a month and then they all went back to zero and i couldn't get past 20k a month and then on my sixth try we went from zero to 300 in a year just to give perspective it wasn't like we went from zero to 300 in a year as you guys know it's 10 to 300 but let's keep going with zero sounds cool <laughs> but uh, there was five five agencies that hit the same plateau every single time the big difference maker for me was like a partner who was ahead of me, but enforced me to grow and was better at the, my partner solved the bottleneck. Like he, he knew how to get to hundred K sales wise. So I didn't actually solve the bottleneck myself. I just found somebody who could just to give perspective on that. But yeah. Dude, you gotta, you gotta get convinced Jared to come and do one of these now. Uh, oh, you just dude, solved the part too. He's <laughs> dude, you guys like this, Jared's fucking Jared's legit, bro. Jared could run for president. <laughs> Jared's good, man. I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him for sure. He's doing an event for anybody in the States. He's doing an event in Missouri. It's a terrible place to do an event, but it's going to be a good time. 
I'm going to be there. If anybody's in the States, seems like most people are not in the States, but. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's actually where my girlfriend's from originally. And it's so funny yeah. when we walk around Bali and they're like, oh, you're from the US. Where are you from? And she's St. Louis. And they're just. Oh, she's from that. Missouri. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. She's actually from there originally. And their face just goes blank. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. <laughs> Did anyone else want to just drop in just to say any last words to Matt no. before we go and bust out a big, well done nah, piss? <laughs> Matt, I'm in the same position as you. I really need a piss as well. But just one, <laughs> one last question. Uh, just in terms of your closers, what sort of like KPIs are they reaching for in terms of like their close rate and that sort of stuff? Good question. Let's see. So this thing's loading. I have to look at this because I don't do the front end, but let's see. This is a good question. This was last year, but that's fine. So show rate, they are responsible for their show rates okay. because they, I mean, some closers get better show rates than others based off the way they text people. Offer rate, they should be offering about 80%. 90% of the people they actually hop on a showed call with. And now that's even higher because we triage our calls. So we have setters qualify the call. So like almost everybody who's getting on should get an offer. Okay. They should close one out of the four offers they get. And then total call close rate or one out of four offers they make total call close rate should be around 20%. So if they okay. take 10 calls, they should close two. And that's not like crazy numbers. But we're getting cold leads, we're getting leads from paid ads. And like when we hopped on with Hermosi, we didn't talk about Hermosi at all. That's fine. I'll make a video about it. When we hopped on, I was just like, damn, I dropped that one. My bad. We'll have to do another hour. When we hopped on with Hermosi, he gave Jared a lot of props. He was like, dude, like you're getting 20% call close rates for 6K deal. Like you guys, no, you guys have built solid sales foundation, which means a lot coming from Hermosi. So like, I'd say these numbers are pretty good. They're not like, I don't know, like a lot of people will have higher close rates than us, but they're only getting 10 appointments. It's hard to do this when you're getting 377 appointments booked a month. So it's a lot of it's down to volume. A lot of it's, yeah. Dude, when you only have 10 appointments a month, yeah. closing two out of 10, it's easier because you're only focused on those 10 people. But when you have 100,000 appointments a month, then yeah, entropy complexity just increases. So Is that a one call close? You mentioned one call that. Close. We've yeah. always done one call. I don't like to call personally. Okay. Yeah, and I appreciate it. That's my question answered. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you guys. Yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed Henry. I appreciate you. If, yeah, if you guys just want to check out the YouTube, I'll keep dropping stuff there. Hit me up on Instagram if you want to talk. I don't have a course or a program or anything. So I won't pitch you. I won't pitch you in the DMs. That's going to make you want to buy more because it's reverse <laughs> psychology. No, I'm kidding. But if you guys just want to chop it up in the DMs, hit me up. And yeah, I would love to come back and do this another time too, bro. This is so fun. I don't know. I like it. I'm weird. Yeah. Thank you guys. Ibrahim. If there's any, I still feel like I'm pronouncing your name wrong too, dude. I feel <laughs> bad about it. Does anybody else, does that happen to anybody else? Or has everybody mastered Ibrahim's name? Dude, dude you're pretty good, man. Ibrahim. <laughs> oh yeah. Some people know me as Eves from before. I was going to ask you if you had a nickname, dude. Cause that'd be way, that'd be way easier. <laughs> I used to. And then I had this whole like life changing event where I was like, no, I'm going to start using my real name. And Whatever. Ibrahim's good, a, man. Dude, Ibrahim's I had a good. feeling. I was, I, I was going to ask you if it had a nickname, but then I had a feeling you you were going to be like, oh, not really. And I was like, nah, like he wants to be called by his actual name. So is it Ibrahim Turner? Is that right? You, you got it, Matthew. Spot right. on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start using my full name too. Nobody, call, nobody can call me Shields anymore. Matthew Shields, that's it. All right, man. I appreciate you guys. Much love. Thanks for, uh, for hopping on. Thanks for having me, Ibrahim Turner. And I'll see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> nah, thanks again, man. Appreciate you so much. Big love. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks, guys. Matt Shields has left the building.